bad that uh, uh, Plymouth Rock didn't land on the pilgrims instead of the other way around, that we kind of an antex thing in our culture, uh, uh, that we just feel it's, it's bad. The doctor told me in 15 minutes he could teach the mechanics of sex. The mechanics of sex is quite an ugly thing. It's a new day, Johnny, that belongs to you and me. You know what starts the egg growing? Well, I just want a sperm. The dark creatures from a world of barbarism and savagery have been unleashed in the once peaceful classrooms of America, disguised as sex education. The primordial forces of man's strongest force are being unleashed to be used against the intended victims, your children. Coming in peace, coming in joy, coming in love, coming in love. I mean, certainly when a man and a wife have sexual intercourse, they feel closer together. I mean, I'm married, and I'm glad I have sexual intercourse with my wife, and it's something that uh, brings us together. It's one of the nice things that we do together. There are lots of them, and this is one of them. It's a new voice calling. You can hear it if you try. And it's growing stronger with each day that passes by. There's a friend. In the Germantown Friends School in Philadelphia, formal sex education is limited to this six-week course taught by Eric Johnson. His book, Love and Sex in Plain Language, is a standard text in many schools. This school pioneered sex education in all areas of study in a free and open context. Read the, read the main headings that there are in that chapter. Homosexuality. Okay. And the next is? Masturbation. What, what is masturbation? Oh. I think it's when um, somebody sort of feels around with themselves and their genitals, <laughs> or sort of, you know. It's stimulating it's yourself right, sexually. Right. Right. Well, let's, <laughs> let's talk about <laughs> masturbation. <laughs> uh, as I say it, Concerning masturbation, it can get out of hand, and so we are... Uh... Man is the only animal that blushes, or has to, Mark Twain. The three R's, and sex education. Gordon Drake, a politically ultra-conservative writer and lecturer, is generally credited with, and or accused of, igniting the current sex education controversy with his pamphlet, Is the Schoolhouse the Proper Place to Teach Raw Sex? A catalog of alleged horrors committed in the classroom. Claims, for example, that children make clay models of the penis. Drake struck one of the most sensitive fibers in the American Puritan ethic, already outraged by the seeming excesses of our young. And when a detailed study course of sex education and family life was suggested in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, as in community after community, there was conjured up the image of a communist conspiracy to undermine the American family and its moral prerogatives. Cedar Rapids had, in fact, been teaching the human reproductive process for years in biology or hygiene classes. But now the city was confronted with a study course which would examine not only the physical, but attitudes and values. Most community leaders supported it, facing a relatively small but highly vocal opposition. A local chapter of Motorid, the movement to restore decency was formed. So was Crisis, Cedar Rapidians imploring sanity in schools. The lines were drawn and the verities of a lifestyle captured by Cedar Rapids' most famous citizen, painter Grant Wood, 
were about to be challenged, as they will be in other communities across the nation in the school year ahead. A public school program of family life and sex education had been recommended by the local PTA, a commission of representative citizens headed by Mrs. Deanne Byerly of the school system, took 18 months to make its recommendations for a program from kindergarten to the sixth grade. In October of 1969, they were presented to the Board of Education in an open hearing. Dr. Walter Block. You permit your teachers to teach your child everything, including human values, ethical, moral values, but you leave out the one area in human relationships which is one of the most important ones. When we speak of human sexuality, we are not speaking of teaching the children the technique of sexual intercourse, and there actually are those who believe that we will teach sexual intercourse to kindergarten children. Well, you can't teach it because they wouldn't even know what it means anyhow, so it wouldn't be too dangerous. <laughs> I doubt, or let me put it this way, I wonder how many parents who will be able to talk in public or to their children about a penis and a vagina and the introduction of the one into the other, and that just that is, uh, uh, consists of um, human uh, sexual relationships. There are very many parents, I am sure, who won't even be able to get the words past their lips. Look at it from the viewpoint of the people who are educated. I'm not educated, but I can see when something wrong is happening to our country and our people. If your daughter comes home pregnant after she's had sex education, are you going to stand back and say, well, the school's taught her that? I'm not responsible. The school has taught her that. And it is the responsibility of that parent. We have to answer to rules that God has laid down. Uh, you children, for instance, have to answer to your father and me. I think that we have every right to say to you, we expect certain behavior out of you. Mrs. George Peters, a spokeswoman for crisis. Are the children going to go through a family life education program and come out of 13 years of it with the idea that if you don't hurt anybody else by perhaps picking up a venereal disease or perhaps producing an illegitimate child, if you don't do any of these things or cause any of these problems for society, it is all right. Now, the teacher will have never gotten up, certainly from the classroom, and said, well, today we're going to talk about it's all right to have premarital sex. But do the children come out of it with this idea? All right. Would, would we all agree, let's, let's, would, would you all agree that if she got pregnant and she was unmarried and was in 10th grade, this really couldn't be a particularly, this would be a pretty harmful thing for her and for the kid. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody disagree? It doesn't mean it would ruin her life forever, but certainly it's going to give her a lot more problems than she otherwise will have. And who will get even more problems than, than the mother, pro probably? Oh. Yes. Okay. And the child doesn't get consulted about this. So th this, is, this is a big thing. Isn't it? And if you're going to call the child illegitimate, you really, I suppose, ought to call the, the parents illegitimate, shouldn't you? I mean, the child isn't. There's nothing wrong with the child. It's the parents that have given the child the problem. One of the things I think that I'm concerned about is the fact that I don't think that it's fair to give young people too much of a responsibility in making their own decisions. Yeah, but I was kind of shocked to find out these kids in the second grade are, uh, learned, learned as much as I did. It took me eighth grade to find her all. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we are in real trouble. I think that as far as our sexuality is concerned, that it's just become completely chaotic. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United Attended by a delegation from Iowa, the Christian crusade of Dr. Billy James Hargis holds a convocation on sex in our society, most notably the specter of communist-inspired sex education. Sex in schools, sex in movies, sex in slick national magazines, sex on television, sex on college campuses, sex on Broadway. It is all a part of a satanic conspiracy. Roller, Six. Down, sir. Jackie, um, turn a little bit more profile, honey. You're walking in one of the cats, Mr. Rock. And, uh, hi, Debbie. Greet Debbie. A little hug, a little kiss. There are some who say that the international communists initiated 
the sex revolution in this country. If they did not initiate the sex revolution in entertainment, education, and church circles, they have at least exploited it, and certainly no one has more to gain by it than they have. Sunday morning in Cedar Rapids, the Reverend Charles Proud. In the congregation, Dan Jones, head of the local Birch Society chapter. Cedar Rapids has been deluged with outside materials, some published by the Birch Society itself, but all reflecting its general philosophy. Excerpts of a film strip produced by the John Birch Society. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, unless you enter into the kingdom of heaven. As little children grow up, they are very inquisitive about the world around them. As parents, we are responsible for channeling their interests. Sex has been one of those subjects reserved for the family. Yes, the innocence and humility of children, how wonderful they are. Recently, though, a new subject has been introduced in many schools in the form of continuous sex education from kindergarten through high school. Suddenly, as if overnight, the very young children have been scandalized their innocence dashed to the ground with sex educational slides like these you are about to see. How babies are made. This is a story about you. In dogs, as in cats, horses, and many other animals, the father's sperm pass out of his body through his penis. When a father dog wants to place his sperm in a mother dog, he climbs on her back. This is called mating. Human babies begin just like chicks and puppies. A sperm from the father... I'm not an animal! I'm a child of God! And I don't like to be drawn as an illustration as an animal. I resent to that! Judges, the 17th chapter and verse 6 says, In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man, listen, did that which was right in his own eyes. Let's, uh, what was the definition of responding? Somebody got it? Yeah. Get it and read it, read it aloud, just to remind the class of what it was. A person is responsible in an action if he performs the action or does not perform it, knowing the consequences and keeping them in mind and believing that they are good. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. I want America healed. There's no better country in the world. I can think of no area in growing up in America that is more uh, replete with inadequacies than the area of sex education. This was true when I was growing up, and I believe it is true today. And in many of the complaints that young people uh, present to us, uh, about what is wrong with America, what is hypocritical about America, what is authoritarian about America, what is badly thought out and badly analyzed, uh, the area of sex education uh, is very prominent. A two-day convention of teachers of sex education is opened by Dr. Hester, president of New York University. The featured confrontation, a debate between Gordon Drake and Edgar Baker of the Institute of American Democracy, 
a self-styled watchdog of the extreme right and left. The sex education issue is simply a part of an overall pattern involving control of the school board by persons who share the general viewpoint of the proprietors of the ideology. And it is a vast ideology. The attack on public school sex education is almost word for word the attack on fluoridation. It is the same ideology that is behind the attack on the National Council of Churches. My father used to say that you could call a skunk a, a skunk, a, a polecat, or a sachet kitty. They stink whatever you call them, and I don't care what you call the National Council of Churches. It's the same old stinking socialistic outfit. But communism is a threat, obviously. We're spending our substance financially and physically on fighting communism, so we're going to have to figure out something. It would work right into the Marxist hands, would it not, to divide family and child. I can tell you how I, I deal with my own children. I'd be glad to do that. If little Jody asks a question, we answer it. We don't over-answer it. We answer specifically what she wants. Then if it isn't complete, Jody, then we answer the next question you ask, right? We're, we're all teachers of sex education. Uh, uh, can you think of things that have happened in your, in your classroom experience where you were thrown, you know, where you really weren't ready to answer? Uh, as a kid asked me, well, how do you know when you're going to have an ejaculation? How do you know when you're going to have it? And I, I, I wasn't thrown, but it, I, I hesitated for a while. Yes. How do you know when you're about to ejaculate? How do you know when you're about yes. to ejaculate? Uh, <laughs> Good question. You know when you're about to ejaculate because little by little, a feeling builds up. I've heard Dr. Masters, uh, who did this research on, on human sexual intercourse, human sexual response, describe this. A man's feeling gets higher and higher and higher until at a certain point he just knows. It's like a sneeze. It's nearer a sneeze than anything else. You know when you're going to sneeze, don't you? Yeah, you, you have this tickle and it goes more and more until suddenly you know that no matter what happens, you're going to sneeze. <laughs> you know, All right. that's that's right. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, that might work. It's a, it's a kind of a feeling that grows up, that builds up to the point where finally you know you're going to ejaculate. A man can tell, and a woman can tell when she's about to have an orgasm, too, when she's about to have that rhythmic contraction of her, of her vagina. Uh, it builds up to a point where she finally is going to have it, and she knows it. This is the sort of thing that I really love, where a teachable moment turns out to be one where I'm the one that's taught, and the kids... And I think we've got to face today that ninth graders and 10th graders, and certainly 11th and 12th graders, know a lot more about a lot of these things than we do. They're so full of wonder about their own physiological changes and, and their feeling of being awkward and not knowing quite what this is all about. And it changes so dramatically from one day to the next. And um, so that it really does, I think, come down to emotional reaction to it and response to it with great love. And L-O-V-E is W-O-R-K. So you can't take it on as a, as a recreation. It's an obligation. What do you mean, if they loved each other? What is that? This is a tremendous question, obviously. Well, loving each other, I mean, you do, if you want to have the experience and you take the precautions, I mean, I know you, you can still have a mental, I mean, it do, it's not all body when you do it. You can still have something mentally in it without, you know, without, you don't have to love each other to have sexual intercourse, I mean. That's right. So, um, if you, if you want the experience and you take the precautions, you can still get a great, great, uh, mental feeling besides, even though you don't love each other. You can have a great feeling, uh, while you're doing it and afterwards for a while and then, you know, without love, without love going on. I think what love is respect for each other. The respect for a girl's feelings or a girl respects a boy's feelings. That's a good point, isn't it? Well, if you get along well together and you can talk and you can, you know, share experiences mentally and physically and, and 
you know, if you can share, I think that's the most important part of loving. Oscar A. Anderson, born in Ottumwa, Iowa. Lived in Cedar Rapids 53 years. John C. Boothman, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Resident of Cedar Rapids since 1951. This is Irma Lowe, uh, born in Iowa and a long resident of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. You know, it seems to me that uh, the youth now will welcome some situations that uh, we as individuals couldn't possibly uh, tolerate. Um, we don't like sharing our bath towels. Why should we share our bodies? It seems ridiculous to me. Just hither and yon. It should be the most vital, intimate, and uh, powerful uh, bond. And it isn't anymore. So I, I remember down at the World's Fair in uh, St. Louis. Well, I was probably 19, 20. And there was these uh, women begging you to come in. I mean that, see? I had a Christian feeling that that was wrong. And I got past them as quick as I could. And that's absolutely the God's truth. And uh, there was something about my Christian training that didn't let passion or anything else uh, overcome my, my feeling that it wasn't right. Well, there were a lot of things done in the dark, hidden, you know, mm -hmm. in former days that never came to light. The scriptures say there's nothing hidden but what we, we will be revealed. <laughs> I don't know what to say, whether it was better that way or not. I, I, I am inclined to think that it wasn't. The good old days just weren't that good. I think that the world's getting better and better in spite of everything. Let me show you something here. You know what that is? A kitten. A kitten. A this a is kitten. a kitten. And you know what happened to this kitten? What? Its mother died before it was born. Can you pass it yes, I want to tell you what to look at first because there's a lot of what things to is see in there. Instead of the kittens what is all this here? Remember what we talked about, the afterbirth? Uh -huh. This is the afterbirth, they call it. And that can sack was full of water. It? Yes, you can see yes. through it. And so when the kitten was inside its mother, it was cat? floating in a sack full of water. Is that the baby cat? This is the baby cat, and this is the sack that it was in right there. Do you know why it was floating in water? Why? So, so it wouldn't die. If something bumped the mother, that would sort of be a cushion around the kitten. So see this thing here on the bottom? What? That's called a placenta. Remember you talked about the tube? And the one end of the tube is the placenta, and the other end of the tube is the belly button, right? Who has asked the youngsters of this community whether they want sex education in the schools or not? I have to meet a teenager yet. I have to meet him yet, who has told me we don't want that in the schools. Let's talk to the teenagers and find out what they want. Here is a survey of questions. Now, these are average kids of a big town. This is a cooperative study between Kansas City Social Health Society, University of Missouri, Kansas City School District, uh, workshops on sex education. Now, listen to the things that these are um, some of the most frequently asked questions by a group of 103 some art students concerning uh, sex problems. Now, just listen to this, and maybe this may be an eye-opener to you, what kids do want to know and what they do not know. Number one, is it okay for a girl to sex? Two sex, she says, at least once or twice before marriage. Uh, number two, can you get pregnant any other way than by human relations? Should you really trust a boy? If your brother wants to practice sex, should you let him? What makes parents want you to leave the house or fuss about it when you come home pregnant? Should you have intercourse with a boy on the first night you go out with him, if not on what night? Those are questions that teenagers in this modern society are asking. Do men marry for sex? Nor was that an isolated, atypical study. The Connecticut State Board of Education, in a survey of 5,000 students from kindergarten through 12th grade, found that questions about sex predominated. Teach us what we want to know. Like, I, 
I wasn't told anything about contraceptives, you know, except, you know, like some people took birth control pills to um, regulate their hormones, you know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But I didn't know there was such thing as, I didn't know what vaginal foam was. I still don't. Because of religious opposition, specific contraceptive information is excluded from public school sex education programs. But at the University of Iowa, these women, demanding fuller information at college level, cannot isolate birth control from recollections of their own needs to know. I was brought in complete silence, you know. <laughs> it's just wild. Um, I'm surprised I can talk. Uh, so, yes, I think I did. I learned the hard way, you might say. From experience, I learned I know how I won't bring my children up. Um, I think I can bring my children up in, you know, a free atmosphere where, where sex will be something that is every day, because it is. <laughs> it doesn't just come out at night. <laughs> I think a lot of parents think it's, it's only necessary to demonstrate a good sexual attitude, but not give out any information. I mean, I think, well, it's the case in my parents. I mean, my mother, you know, threw a book at me <laughs> about menstruation. But um, they always, um, you know, had a, a good attitude about their own sexuality. And so I think that was important. I don't even think I related sexuality with my parents. <laughs> Um, I still can't really relate it with my parents. <laughs> my parents do that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the same attitude I had when I, I think it was fifth grade. A girlfriend of mine ran over and said, I read it on the back of a baby calendar. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I didn't believe it. And then when you'd, when I'd see uh, young couples walking with the baby, you know, it was snicker, snicker, they did it. <laughs> that's my thing. It was really pretty crude. <laughs> I remember one day I was in a tree with my girlfriend and her brother had taught her a dirty word. And she told me what it meant and I said, oh, don't believe it. <laughs> I did. I just said, no, that's not the way it is. And then I went home and then we had our movies a couple weeks later and I said, mom, it's true. That's what it is. And she said, she said, well, you know, it's a crude word, but that's how it goes. And I was really upset and I had a lot of trouble accepting it because I had no idea that there was such a thing as sex. And I don't think that's good at all either. Um, that they were just, they were, they were over careful about how to teach it to us. They were really scared to, I think. I mean, it would be, you know, I think one of the traumatic experiences when you, when you come um, to the reali realization that there is sex, I mean, you know, you start having a sex drive, mm -hmm. but you have no information about it. You, know, you, you don't may know think what it, it is. is. Yeah, you, know, you, don't, you may think it's abnormal or something. And since every time you asked a question about it, you were taught that, you know, it was sort of hush-hush, then you sort of get the idea that it's something dirty and vulgar and you shouldn't even talk about it. Mm -hmm. Then you sort of, you know, you can develop a guilt complex or something. In eighth grade, we had a movie, and the boys, <laughs> the boys had a separate movie, and the girls had a separate movie, and your parents could come, you know, so my, your mother's yeah. sitting right there next to you, holding your hand the whole time, <laughs> and, um, so, you know, telling you, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right. <laughs> and they showed, um, they showed, you know, drawings, just flat drawings of, you know, human beings, they didn't even look like human beings, <laughs> we, it was a lot of imagination involved, and um, then we got out, and the boys got out, and all of a sudden, the boys and the girls got together. What was your movie? <laughs> <laughs> you should have seen our movie. And, you know, they made just a big joke out of the whole thing, and everyone got kind of embarrassed. <coughs> and it was, it was very silly. It was uh, poor induction for some kids. But I think a lot of times there's a difference between what parents have practiced themselves and what they wish you to practice. I, I think that the norm has always been um, <coughs> sexual permissiveness with affection, and I think probably my parents have followed that. I, I'd say probably having intercourse before they were married, but I think my mother, when explaining sex to me, would probably say, oh no, you should wait until you were married. Um, I know my parents, whenever I did ask about anything, you know, they try and tell me, you know, and they'd be fairly matter, matter of fact about it, but that was as far as pure science went, but they didn't say anything about the emotions, which is, to me, the bigger part of, of your sex life is your, your emotional well-being. And, you know, that's something that your parents, you know, say uh, is, that's the most hush-hush part of it, you know. Um, everything else is, you know, kind of, I guess they feel it's rather animalistic to tell you about, you know, um, it's natural to have a sex drive and, and once in a while to have some kind of virgin stuff and, and you know, 
you you picture as as something like nice girls don't think about things like that. Nice girls don't never um, want to have uh, intercourse or anything, and and you just you know like you get this view from your parents, and and it's really bad.